Welcome to a special edition virtual event titled Why It Matters, The Roles and Responsibilities of AI. I'm Ina Freed, Chief Technology Correspondent at Axios, coming to you today from San Francisco. So welcome to our audiences on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, and on Axios.com. You can join in the conversation today on Twitter using at Axios and the hashtag Axios events. In today's virtual event, we'll be covering the latest around AI and weighing both the good it can do and the challenges. I'm excited to be joined by my colleague, Axios Global Technology Correspondent, Ryan Heath. Ryan, great to be with you and uh, to be doing this conversation together. Hey, Ina, I am very excited to chat. Everything in AI is so hot right now. So maybe let's kick it off. Um, let's unpack a bit what is AI and what isn't. You know, for example, just because something's automated, that doesn't mean it's AI. Uh, do you want to help us kick the ball along? Yeah, I mean, you know, this term artificial intelligence is not a new term. And actually, there's plenty of technology we use today that is AI, at least in the way it was defined. One of the things someone said recently, and it's so true and it's really stuck with me, is we don't actually apply the term AI to most things that incorporate AI. Once we use it in our life, we don't think of it as AI anymore. We just think of it as technology. Um, but things like autocomplete in Gmail or uh, autocorrect on your phone, that's a form of AI. All the machine learning that has powered language translation and so many advances, that's all AI. There is a separate class of AI, generative AI, that is really hot right now. And that's things like ChatGPT or Dolly or MidJourney for art, where you're typing something into a text box. But that's not the only kind of AI. So it's important to remember AI is both broader than just ChatGPT, but it's also not everything that people want to apply that label to. Actually, I think that's probably the most important distinction where what we've got now has really touched a nerve because it feels like it reaches into our humanity and does things that that we always thought only humans could do. But even stuff like ChatGPT, that's really a narrow form of artificial intelligence. It is a machine that is learning from what's fed into it, and the learning is a really important part. But it's not a machine that's just learning on its own, and it's not anywhere close to that artificial general intelligence that does worry a lot of people when, when the machine takes on a godlike capacity to, to make decisions and, and potentially control us. Yeah, that's what's so fascinating to me about this moment is, on the one hand, you know, you play with chat GPT or any of these things are incredibly powerful. But to your point, the way they work is not very human like at all. They've basically memorized the whole internet and learned a lot about what words are likely to follow other words. But that's so far from human intelligence. Like, it's scary good, but it's, in a sense, just regurgitating things in the past. It wouldn't know what to do if it encountered a truly novel situation. It's just really good at predicting how humans write and paint and do other things. Yeah, it's really uh, developing productivity, but it got a long way to go on some of the creativity and the accuracy issues, I'd say. Well, you mentioned that, and that I think is a great segue into looking at what is AI or this new form of generative AI really good at today. Um, it's being applied very broadly. You know, companies are using it for everything from, you know, how to paint something to how to handle help desk things, but it's not equally good at different tasks. And not every task that someone's applying it to is really the best use. Um, to me, it's fascinating that it's being applied to search because search is actually one of those things where I don't want a 90% correct answer, but that's what, yep. you know, chat GPT gives you and even less so if it's really current um, because you can't really tell. One of the things about the generative AI is it always sounds good. It's always sure of itself, but it might be making it up. And what interests me is that's actually really good for creative tasks. So if you're writing something creative, if you're painting, if you're looking for ideas, that's actually where generative is really good today. Whereas a lot of the truly fact-based things, some of our older technologies can be more precise. 
Yeah, I think that we're really going to see that the AI is going to be extremely helpful in some of those early stage tasks or ones that you can keep internal facing. But think about it, if you're a big company and you either have legal liabilities or very demanding customers, like to let some of this technology loose onto them at the moment would really create a big series of risks for you. So the, the productivity doesn't come from just throwing the AI out at every person in every situation, but really figuring out, okay, I can help the customer service representative come up with better suggestions and solutions for the angry person that they're chatting with. Uh, or the, the best case I heard of, I think, was uh, in the legal industry, where one lawyer I was speaking to said that out of college, she spent five and a half months gathering documents as part of a discovery process for an important case. And now they can find those documents in 40 minutes. So less than an hour down from five months. So there are some real gains there, uh, especially when it's retrieval and computational. Um, but you know, I wouldn't want to marry uh, an AI at the end of the day. I think there are some things humans still do better. Definitely. And you point out an important thing, which is in most of the use cases we're seeing, even in business, and there are a ton of interesting uses in business, it's generally about making a human more productive. That's where it's really good today. And the companies, for a variety of reasons, both for what it's good at, but also for legal liability, none of them are saying, you know, here, run this AI script and just let it go. They're always, they talk about a human in the loop, whether it's Salesforce or Microsoft. Um, when they're talking about business uses, they're always saying, we'll give you suggestions on how to write an email or what to say to a customer, but you should always fact check it. You should gut check it. Make sure this sounds right. And I think that's a good indication of where we are today. Yeah. And I think about where we're going to head next, and probably it's uh, not a situation of mass unemployment, but you're going to need to learn how to make use of the AI and work with AI tools. Otherwise, you do risk being left behind. But at the same time, we're going to start to see more and more guardrails being put in place. So I think it's worth digging into a little bit where we think those guardrails are going to come or where they're most needed. Um, because, you know, there is an awful amount of misinformation, scams, uh, other threats to our institutions if we don't have systems in place for, for putting limits on, on AI. Um, where, where do you think is some of the most fruitful ground in, in that part of the debate, Ina? Yeah, I mean, broadly speaking, misinformation, but that has so many meanings and they're all relevant here. Um, people are going to harness AI for all kinds of great uses, but they're also going to harness them for things we don't want. And when I talk to experts in the field, the area they're most concerned about is misinformation and some of the forms that takes. Obviously, political misinformation, um, it's things like scams uh, where it can generate really convincing sounding scams. Yep. Your phishing emails are about to get a lot worse. Um, it's for profit, it's for um, economic gain, it's for mischief. Um, so it's all of those things. And I think we're going to have to get better. And that means companies coming up with automated tools. Um, it mm. means watermarking videos and, and other things so that we know they were uh, created artificially. It means having a provenance chain so that you can tell this is footage that was legitimately captured from a device and here's everything that's happened to it along the way. We need way more tools than we have right now to live in a world where AI is generating so much information. And I know, Ryan, you're really keen on, on the election aspect of this. Yeah, absolutely. So I think the pressure is going to come from two angles with these guardrails. One will come from the companies themselves. Uh, and that's more because you can't afford to have a 12% or higher error rate with the information that you're sharing uh, with your, your customers and your stakeholders. And then on the political side of things, I think nothing focuses a politician's mind more than uh, their own ego or their own re-election chances. And I think with the AI tools that we have at our disposal now, the ability to deceive and confuse people at a scale of millions at a time is, is so great and so easy that I think uh, politicians are going to realize in the 2024 US campaign, which obviously goes for more than a year in reality, and a series of other big elections around the world, that there will need to be some very um, specific rules and limits on how AI can be used. 
Otherwise, you begin on a slippery slope to a situation that, you know, is a long way off yet. But the reality is um, leaders like Vladimir Putin get to stay in power because they've helped construct societies where people don't know what is true from false. And it's easier just to, to give up and let the authoritarian be in charge. And uh, he did that without AI. So now that everyone has AI to be able to create um, those tricky situations, we do actually have to be on guard to avoid having that here in our democracies. Yeah, a couple of thoughts on that. I mean, in terms of <clears throat> in terms of what to expect, to me, I look at what did social media deliver, and basically, mm -hmm. AI is going to allow every problem to be increasingly large, uh, exponentially large. So you mentioned the ability to deceive millions of a time at a time. That's certainly an issue. I mean, if you think of deep fake video or audio, that's certainly a way to fool millions of people at a time. But there's also the ability to really target messages, which we certainly saw in the social media era with Cambridge Analytica. AI is going to help you do that at scale. So the dream for a lot of marketers is the ability to do one-to-one -one marketing, to say, hey, Ryan, you know, I know you and here's my pitch. Expect candidates and others that are looking to manipulate to use that as a way to target their message as well. So I generally think if we want to look at the harms of AI misinformation, just look at where we are today with the misinformation. And the thing I really do find worrisome is we haven't been doing very well as a society already at finding truth. I mean, you take something like the vaccine, you have a highly effective vaccine with minimal side effects, and it's become a big point of debate. I really do worry how we're going to do as a society with an era of AI misinformation. And one big question I have then is whether we need to use existing sort of fields of regulation and existing actual regulations and maybe just supplement them, or do we need whole new forms of regulation? And it feels to me like there is a big gap opening up between different jurisdictions around the world. There's really no global consensus at this point, is there? There isn't. Um, as you point out, I think we probably are going to need a mix. So um, for the short term, and even in some areas, you're going to want to rely on existing laws. So if yep. AI is deciding who gets hired, we actually have laws that prevent discrimination in hiring. And actually, in a narrow field where we have great laws already or good laws, I wouldn't say great, but good laws around discrimination, loans, employment, housing, those sorts of things, the existing laws may work. But for whole new problems that just didn't exist I think we will need new legislation, and we are seeing a big global divide here, and it's falling along the lines we've seen previously. You've covered this a ton, but, you know, we're seeing, you know, the U.S. talk but not really act. We're seeing the EU say, you know, our citizens are at risk and we're going to act quickly. They're almost done with an AI act. And then we're seeing this U.S.-China battle shape up that uh, we've seen in other areas of technology. Yeah. Yeah, you can really almost divide it up into sort of pretty neat boxes where you've got China is out there leading in research at the moment, and actually they're first across the line with some regulation. Uh, the EU, uh, big regulator, also trying to act a bit as the conscience of the world, not that everyone accepts them positioning themselves that way. India is acting as the workforce behind a lot of this. And the US, of course, is leading in innovation, but a bit slow uh, to catch up with, with all the rules and the regulations. So, you know, we've got to look below the surface in these debates. The EU and China are going to make mistakes by going first with their regulations, but that shouldn't give the US a free pass to not do anything to get up to speed. Uh, and at the end of the day, you know, China's got some very interesting methods here. They want to try and increase trust in AI because they want to be able to surveil their population. And they're being pretty successful at that. And obviously, the underlying point of all of that is for the Communist Party of China to remain in charge. So, you know, the point there is I want people listening here to, to think about what are the second and third layers and motives when people try and come in with these guardrails and these regulations. Yeah. And as you point out, I mean, China may be doing a lot of regulation, but it's important to recognize it's regulation on what Chinese companies can and can't do, not on what the government can do. So one of the reasons they're leading in a lot of data areas is they've already been doing a lot of mass surveillance and they are more willing to allow or the you know administration just declares um, what's permissible. So they're regulating what companies can do, but the government is actually 
more using and adopting of these technologies than elsewhere in the world. Yeah, and I think like we've just had the Indian Prime Minister visit Washington, and one of the big points there is that the US needs partners in democracies like India, however complicated that may be, like the other leading democracies in the world, because it's only through those forms of partnerships and coordination that, that the democracies will be able to outmaneuver the more authoritarian countries. Well, we've covered a lot of ground, Ina. Thank you, everyone, for joining another conversation that made you smarter, faster. For more coverage on what's trending around AI, you can sign up for the Axios login newsletter written by me and Ina. Go to axios.com backslash newsletters or head to the Axios app. Stay tuned for more updates around interviews with key newsmakers around AI later this year. And thanks for joining. We'll see you next time. Oh,